So we're going to explore various issues around broadening uh, how we consider toxicity information in green chemistry design and pull in some of the balancing issues in this panel discussion. To start it off, we've asked Mark Johnson, who's with the U.S. Army uh, and has done quite a um, has, has done quite a considerable amount of thinking in greening some of the uh, ordinance, I guess, used by the Army. Um, and so he will start us off with a few opening remarks to get our thinking around a practical problem. So, Mark, please. Thanks, Lauren. It, it's absolutely, absolutely essential for the future of the military to be able to train, test, develop weapons in a sustainable way as installations. And uh, with increasing human density, the slide on the left here shows that in many cases we actually have fe uh, houses right up to the fence line. So it comes with, with that comes an increasing scrutiny of what's going on on the other side of the fence. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, the Army Environmental Quality Technology Program under its Pollution Prevention Pillar came up with the Ordinance Environmental Program. And that, that program was developed to come up with greener munitions for ones that do not explode the low-order detonations or unexploded ordnance, the ones that could be potential sources that would create problems regarding sustainability. And so with that, uh, proposals were accepted from RE researchers, the chemists, to come up with replacements for compounds such as RDX and perchlorate and some other explosives you may be familiar with. Um, but the first question that came to the program developers were, how do we know these replacements are any better than the ones that we have? And so they, they came to us and said, can we it, can you help us understand if these chemicals or compounds are better? And so it was very interesting to me to see, particularly in this meeting that we have today, so many tiered approaches. Um, most all of them developed in isolation. I know when I first looked in, in the literature for other approaches on how to deal with this, I found very few. I found one in veterinary pharmaceuticals that was very interesting. But um, traditionally, it, it, took me, uh, it took us all a while to think about this problem. What kind of chemical physical properties should we be interested in? What kind of toxicity information do we need to have? And how can we phase that into the relative resources they're developing in developing new compounds, synthesizing those, coming up with formulations, and ultimately coming up with a new weapon system? And so what, what you see here is based on a GAO report that's, uh, that's, that's dated that suggests the kind of money that's involved in cleaning up our ranges. For the Army, it can be very significant, as you see here. But this stepwise approach here is really, these, each step is devoted to different funding lines. And this is, uh, these are milestones that's based on the acquisition. This is all DOD language in developing a new weapon system or platform. And, and this is kind of how we don't want to do business, is ask this environmental safety occupational health question at the end. We want to ask this question at every stage. In the pure research side, the applied research side, testing and evaluation, manufacturing, all this thing, we want to ask this question, this iterative approach. And so, this is kind of, again, that, that funding approach here with BA is pure research, this is uh, applied research and so forth. Uh, conception, we, we've actually applied tags these different areas of research on the chemist side of developing new compounds, where conception is where they're just working on a computer, they're developing a new molecule um, <clears throat> on a computer that has the types of attributes that they want to see and they're getting kind of, the, kind of performance properties that they hope to achieve. At this stage, we don't have a compound to work with. We don't even know if we can make it, but there's some things we can tell them in this iterative way about uh, persistence by accumulation and toxicity using QSAR approaches and computational tox, and that's what we've done in this area here. Um, for synthesis is when we actually can develop and actually make the compound, and sometimes that's not possible. In a lot of cases, there are compounds we cannot make, but when we do, we're only making gram quantities at the desktop stage, and so at that point, uh, there are some experimental data required, mostly in vitro techniques. And so here is where I see a great promise for some of the tools that we're talking about today to actually apply some of the um, different in vitro methods that don't acquire a lot of compounds. And again, we're not talking about a, a whole lot of uh, resources devoted to that project. In the testing stage, uh, I call this the five kilogram bucket stage where we're scaling up our synthesis. At this point, we do have people that are potentially exposed. And so at this point, we do want to have more rigor and the sort of toxicology information that we want to have uh, to ensure safety. And in each stage, we, we provide the chemists with information back and forth. The demonstration validation stage is really, really we're going from chemicals into formulations. And why I think that's really important is because you may have a compound that shows you, based on your earlier toxicity results, that it may, may be quite toxic. When you can mix it into a formulation, you may be able to reduce the 
propensity of, of exposure. You may be able to mix binders, plasticizers, that sort of thing to eliminate the water solubility, for example, of a compound that could be released into the environment. Now, in the Army currently, we do have lots of different environmental uh, regulations up here, and that's what these acronyms stand for, a bunch of different ones, some of these you may, may be familiar with. Uh, life cycle assessment, programmatic environmental safety and health evaluation, but none of these actually have a data requirement associated with it. And I think that's more where we're hoping to go, is actually fulfill some of these documents with actually data requirements, some information that you need. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that some of these compounds are quite unique. Um, some of these compounds, you cannot get any more nitrogen on them if you tried. And uh, they, they present some very unique QSAR dilemmas. And so um, I know scientist Maggie Hurley at the Army Research Lab has developed some very sophisticated QSARs that are specific to nitrogen-based compounds. Some of these organic-based QSARs don't tend to work so well. Just to talk about some of the successes that we've had so far, um, one is this uh, colored smoke grenade. It's a signaling grenade called the M18. Um, turns out that in urban warfare, it's used more as an obscurant, not necessarily as a signaling device. So exposure criteria have changed to what we originally expected. And so they went from a sulfur to a sugar-based fuel, which meant it got hotter and we had to go to different dyes. And so before, th in the early stages, we were able to test the toxicity of solvent violet 47, which was a dye they were beginning to use for the violet uh, grenade. And it turned out to be relatively toxic compared to the red and blue mix that gave the same performance result. And they were able to switch to the red and blue uh, with no decrement in cost and with a lot, a lot, lot lower toxicity associated with it. Um, when we did some further testing, we also found that some of the compounds in this smoke um, that were of a concern to us was not the components in the formulation at all, but with the container. The container had some lead in it, so we were able to change the container, and that gave us something that's a little bit uh, less toxic and, and better for the environment and for the soldier as well. Uh, some of the explosives that we're looking to replace is RDX. Um, we understand that the, the primary ex uh, effect from exposure to RDX is neurotoxicological. We did not have a really good in vitro model to look at differences in neurotoxicological function. So uh, with some help of some other folks, we developed a, a uh, calcium efflux assay. I'll show you that real briefly and helping us to look at um, in vitro aspects of, of neurotoxicity. Uh, some simulators, uh, uh, these simulators, M15, the whistle bang flash um, have perchlorate in them. They have been now replaced with uh, black powder. It turns out old standby worked just as well. And so we were able to help them in developing that. One way you can look at these sorts of data, and, and you've seen this from other presentations earlier in this uh, workshop, is just based on relative ranking. And this is, I believe, uh, the uh, a liver cell line where we used neutral red exclusion. And we ranked all these, these 35 different compounds, the relative toxicity according to these in vitro assays relative to the compound we're trying to replace, RDX. And he, some of these obviously, obviously look a lot better than, than some other ones. And the final slide was what I mentioned earlier about the calcium influx. This gives us uh, a more of a human health relevance to neurotoxicity where these concentrations uh, of RDX systemically in rats gave the same sort of, of effect in, in, in manifestation of convulsions as it did in this assay in calcium efflux in the cell line. So we were able to use this as a screen to help us understand a little bit more about a compound's propensity for neurotoxicity in addition to using ligand binding assays and other pharmacologic tools that, that many of you are aware of. And so that's all I had just to get it started. If there's any questions? Thanks, any questions? Okay, a real good practical example with a way forward. Um, now I'd like to, oh, there is a question. Yeah, Dave. That was a really nice presentation. Um, I've, one question, and it, it's a leading question to an issue that I think might be worth discussing. There's been, this issue's been brought up, but there's a lot of value to making these type of data publicly available. And it's something that's been at the forefront of the efforts within Comp Talks and Talks 21. And we've had, Mark, we've had discussions about that. Um, DOD has had discussions with Talks 21. Um, other partners have had discussions with Tox21, and, and a condition of becoming a Tox21 or Toxcast partner has always been that the data that's generated as a part of this effort, this collaboration or whatever, will be made publicly available, such that it can be brought into this larger community. And you know, 
Robert Tangway and I were talking about this, you know, he's, he's wanting to make his data publicly available and to be able to, to make these comparisons. And I think that's part of um, a, a broader issue that we should be discussing the rest of this morning um, because a little bit of data here, a little bit of data there, this chemical here, this chemical there, it doesn't get us out of the, the, the limitations of where we are today in toxicology of taking subsets of data, subsets of chemicals, you know, looking under the light post and, and not doing it in a transparent way and engaging the broader community because it's done in a public forum, an open source kind of format. Yeah, that's a very good point. And so we it, it, it's more of a comment and, and this is not, you know, that you're not making that publicly available. I think there probably is a lot of opportunities for, to, for you to do that with this information. But, you know, over and over this morning I've been struck by these lines of data and lines of uh, information that get balkanized and are not brought together. Yeah, and absolutely. I think yesterday we heard many, many examples where there was a call for data sharing. I think I, I counted something like five or six different speakers bringing that up or in comments to them. Mark, did you want to respond? Yeah, I think it's a great point, Dave. Absolutely agree. And uh, that's why we're very interested in what you, you guys come up with in ToxCast and Tox21 to integrate a lot of those assays that show a lot of promise in what we're doing. And what I'd really like to do is integrate with the folks, the other folks who came up with tiered approaches to talk about what works and what doesn't. Because we've already found a lot of things that, that don't work. The, uh, for example, the, the stoplight charts, the red, amber, uh, green, even though they're simple to interpret, some compounds just don't fall. Like, like the one presentation I think we just saw earlier that Tom presented where you don't always get, you get green mixed with red and get, get mixed with yellow. And, and to, to find those bright lines become difficult. Yeah. Well, now what I'd like to do is turn to each of the panelists who haven't made a presentation to date to make some initial comments reflecting on the presentations they heard earlier today. Um, so the first would be Kate Guyton, who's a toxicologist <coughs> with the EPA's National Center for Environmental Assessment within the Office of Research and Development. She's co-authored a number of very important uh, health assessments, some of which are still uh, getting out the door, uh, which I think speaks to the challenge of what happens when you're trying to do things at the end of the regulatory pipeline rather than up front and early. And Kate's also authored a number of very important scientific publications looking at existing methodology and improving upon us. So, Kate. Thank you, Lauren, for that very nice introduction. Um, I, I uh, also wanted to echo what we've heard today, that I think this has just been a very exciting meeting. Uh, we've had some really stimulating presentations, and it really is an honor to be in this company um, and, to, and to really consider the issues. So. What I wanted to do was really to reflect on some of the discussions of the past day and a half and, and hopefully maybe throw out some, some ideas to stimulate additional discussion. Uh, but I will begin by saying that, yes, I am an EPA employee. I do not speak for the agency, so just consider the comments that I make today are my own opinion. Um, so I think what we heard about is really there's a lot of, there's a lot of new data as well as tools and, and models, and that includes computational uh, models. And on the other side, um, we've got decisions that we want to make. So that's kind of where we sit is really kind of using this information to make those decisions. And, and what do we want to do? What are really our goals? I think it's really to increase efficiency. I was a little bit jealous when Helen Holder was speaking and saying that uh, she got to get information and then make a decision by the end of the day. And I don't know how familiar you might be with the Irish program, but let me just say that the unit of time is not a day. Uh, and I won't comment further upon that. Um, but, you know, that's, and essentially you're, you're, in a, you're in a situation where you're developing a product and we are trying to inform cleanup decisions um, and regulations in air and, and water and soil that really affect a large number of people. So, I mean, the, the magnitude of the decisions that we're trying to inform are, are really, is really high. And, and I think because of all of the complexities that it can get bogged down. So I think we've had a lot of advice from the National Academies and others about how we can really move this forward. And I think there's been um, some some ideas that we've heard in the past couple of days that I'll just just highlight where I think um, maybe we can we can think about improvements. Um, 
And Richard Dennison made some interesting comments yesterday, and part of, I think, what we've been challenged to do by, by the academies um, and by interested um, parties in what we're doing is really to consider population risk. And that includes thinking about um, some of the issues Richard raised, which include the variability within the population, the differences in exposure patterns, including mixtures, um, the timing, and also the chronicity of the exposure. And also I thought uh, Robert Tangway and Jim Hutchison yesterday, really kind of the context of the exposure. So when you're thinking about a substance, what is really being presented? Is it is it is still intact and where is it kind of in the media that's really that you really need to, to conceptualize. So um, I, I guess I was thinking in terms of this variability, there's a couple of examples uh, from the pharmaceutical world where you can think about um, a drug having an impact. Is it really that the entire population is at the same risk or is it that there are certain populations based on taking another drug or because of, of who they are or because of their genetic susceptibility that it's going to have a different response. And I think from the chemical world, those, those, are, those are some examples that I think can kind of help you conceptualize, do we need to worry about a special population or do we need to really worry about an issue that applies broadly? And I think some examples would be um, Seldane, which was, a, which was a drug marketed for asthma, and really was unable to define a safe dose when you considered it in the context of other commonly prescribed medications, uh, which included the uh, macrolide antibiotics. So what you have is a co-exposure that you just cannot really separate. So for a large group of the population, you're having this co-exposure, and, and that's, that's really increasing a risk to a substance that otherwise really isn't risky. Um, so those kinds of complex issues is what we really r wrestle with when we think about population risk. And I wanted to go back to something that Tom, Tom raised earlier. Um, in some of our IRIS assessments, I will say we do use a NOAL, and then we apply uncertainty factors, and that's kind of been the standard practice, I think, in risk assessment uh, for a long time. Um, and I think in, in some of the thinking about the new tools and data, we have that same paradigm. And I'm, I'm sort of wondering, and maybe I would, could challenge some people to really comment on whether that's really the approach we want to think about. And really whether it's uh, some point of departure, whether it be from an in vitro study or an in vivo study, is that really the most important factor, or is it the fact of how you're considering that chemical in context? And just to give any, to give um, some of the data that I think David showed, David Dix showed yesterday, um, and and others is really how promis promiscuous that chemical really is. So when you're coming to the point of departure, you're collapsing a lot of information. And what's that information you're collapsing? First of all, it's the effects on many many other pathways. So when you think about that chemical in the context of other chemicals where we already know we are being exposed or maybe part of the same molecule or packaging of that molecule, is it really that you're hitting so many other pathways that that's really going to be the driver of toxicity rather than this particular point of departure um, itself? And the other aspect is, I think, when, when you look at the exposure data in the slide that Tom showed from the very nice paper by, by Richard Judson, is really you have that exposure data so you can look at those other chemicals that are in that mix and try to identify, well, what would be the factors that would make this chemical really of concern or not? So, uh, I mean, those are some of, the, some of the ways I think you could think about moving beyond this point of departure, no AL approach, which leads to a safe dose. Uh, and, and once you get to a point where you're talking about what's a safe dose for a chemical, I can tell you that that really polarizes people because it, 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 it kind of focuses people on, well, that, you know, you're saying what about my chemical that it's costing me X amount of dollars and, and whether it's, it's another part of the government or whether it's, it's a, a private company that uh, that's a conversation that I'm not sure has a has a as good as an answer is let's try to think about alternatives and, and we agree with that but we do have a charge I think to to look at the existing chemicals and I think some of the same thinking applies uh, very well to what for what we're doing and really in terms of those decisions it's really prioritizing chemicals for assessment for prioritizing them for for further testing, and I think David David just spoke to that issue of, you know, what are the data gaps we really need to fill, and, and really 
what are the critical data gaps? And I think some thinking about really what's the critical piece of information you would want, w I think would help the risk assessment um, community. And, and I also would just make a small plug that, you know, I, I, I really love the idea of getting chemists and toxicologists together. Um, and, and I would just say in that it, to come into some decision science, to some risk assessment science, that to bring those different parties together, I think would really help inform not only what the research needs are for the academic community, but also how we can kind of advance our regulatory science in pace with some of these other developments. So thank you very much for the opportunity to make these comments. And again, it's just a very exciting meeting. And thanks to everyone for the great presentations. Thank you, Kate. Um, some precautionary notes on the data interpretation side for quick use of the toxicity information and um, the whole issue of background exposure. And I don't think that that's come up earlier today. So uh, thank you for your comments. Um, the next uh, commenter is Jennifer Sass. Jennifer is a senior scientist with the National Research Resource Defense Council. Um, she's in their environmental health program. She's a professorial lecturer at George Washington University. And at NRDC, she reviews the science, the scientific underpinnings, and advocates for adequate protection of the public's health through science. So Jennifer. Thanks, Lauren. Um, well, it is um, a really exciting meeting. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I've enjoyed all the presentations yesterday and today. Um, and um, I'm going to sum up a little of some of the things that really meant something to me in the work that I do. I work in um, policy, so um, my job as an environmental, as a scientist for an environmental nonprofit group, is to advocate for um, more protective, more health protective, and environmentally protective policy and regulation of toxic chemicals. Um, so, um, first of all, there were some um, exciting um, comments, even by Mark a few minutes ago, but as well actually running through most of the talks, um, it, w with the idea of asking the questions about environmental health and safety at every stage of product development, um, safety being very different questions and health, of course. Um, so it was um, exciting to see that all the way through, and I want to emphasize that. Um, that also came up in the from the floor yesterday, um, Lynn Katz-Cherry in the audience mentioned that in her talk that we need to have environment or in her question sorry from the floor um, that we need to have environmental health and safety protections um, question those questions integrated practically um, right from the research and development or um, product development and product design um, stages all the way through I think that's really important so that we don't keep repeating um, the problems that we have now um, also, there was some, um, I liked what Tom had to say this morning, um, and a few other people brought up, actually had different opinions. I don't think there was a complete consensus about the role of hazard, um, the role of risk, the role of exposure and potency, but um, I liked what Tom had to say, which is that there's a role for all of them, and I think that's true at different stages. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be a fisticuff. Um, although, of course, if it does come down to one, um, I think my opinion should win, um, and uh, which is that um, hazard and potency um, are, are really important for um, evaluating and ranking chemicals. But um, I liked what Tom had to say, that there's an important role for risk and prioritization, and I think that really makes sense. Um, I want to bring up the um, precautionary principle or precautionary words as well. Um, and that, again, goes to asking questions first and early in the stage about um, health and safety and developing assessment approaches that are not, not necessarily as data intensive as other assessment approaches, but making sure that we can deal with where we don't have data and where we do have data um, and um, being precautious or, or applying precautionary approaches where we don't have data. And I thought Cal's presentation this morning, uh, as well as Helen's talk yesterday, um, both presented um, really practical situations. I think, Helen, you were using the, also the, um, green, the Clean Production Actions um, green screen, which DFE also applies. Um, so you have areas in that where if you have more data, you can fill it or inform it. Um, and if you don't have the data, then you can make extrapolations or um, scientific-based assumptions. And I think that's really important. 
Um, one thing um, that I do want to bring up um, is how do we incorporate the actual published data? I mean, how do we deal with the chemicals like what Kate and what EPA and regulators have to deal with where you actually do know a heck of a lot because um, the chemicals have been around for a couple of decades and there are um, this pretty uh, large database on them. Somebody um, brought up what they called the elephant in the room this morning during Cal's presentation, um, BPA. Um, so I want to pull out from that what, what the elephant means. Um, and, and one is that there's a lot of published data. There's a, we know a lot about BPA, so actually how do we incorporate the fact that we really do know a lot about that chemical? And then the other thing about that was the endocrine disruption um, or um, hormone disruption activity. And also from the floor yesterday, um, Pete Myers brought up that specifically um, how do we incorporate the fact that endocrine disrupting chemicals don't actually comport with traditional toxicological assumptions? Um, BPA is an example of that. A triclosan, which got brought up um, in a presentation this morning, is an example of that, and there's a lot of them, of course. Um, perchlorate is an excellent example of thyroid inhibitor. So um, really, how do we actually incorporate the published data, the stuff we do know? How do we, how do we know what we know and incorporate it and not just pretend we don't know that and pretend it doesn't exist is really critical. Um, Helen brought up in her presentation yesterday that they're actually beginning to tackle a nano assessment using the DFE and uh, I'm sorry, using um, the green screen or at least think about it and I know that that's important. So again, that's an example where we, we do know things. We definitely know things. We know enough to, to proceed. If we know enough to produce it, then we should know enough to evaluate it, right? Um, but um, we have less data on that. So dealing with the fact that we have published data, we know things, some we know a lot about, some we know not so much about. It was exciting to me that there was a lot of different um, assessment or evaluation frameworks presented and that some of them could, um, could uh, address m uh, more data and some of them where we don't have as much data. But I think the hormone or endocrine disrupting thing really needs to be addressed really clearly. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is how do we share the conversation that we had yesterday and today further um, because there was so many um, really exciting and really practical things that got brought up yesterday and today um, really from the span of, of the bench um, to product design and product implementation to um, regulatory or policy approaches. Um, there was a lot of government speakers and there was a lot of um, industry um, speakers and then all sorts of um, scientists in between. Um, and, and there were so many good things brought up. So I guess the last thing I have to say is how do we get this out? How do we get um, the information that was brought up out? Because it's such a, so important um, to get out of lethargy and to move these kinds of um, assessments forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to bring up that on your last point, um, the webcasts will be posted, so they're going to be available, and I think we can all pass the links along to our colleagues and try to get more dissemination of the webcast. So very good point, and thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to the next panelist, which is Tad Shug, uh, who's at, with the NIEHS Cellular Organs and Systems Pathobiology Branch. And that... Uh, manages a portfolio of grants in um, male and female reproduction and developmental toxicity and has been thinking a lot about frameworks for endocrine disruption and use of and categorization of those data. So that. So um, I wanted to speak about a, a project that I've been working on uh, for the past year with a group of green chemists and biologists, many of whom are in the room here, on developing a, a protocol and the guiding principles behind that protocol of how we could, green chemists could go about determining whether a uh, chemical they're developing is um, toxic or not, and and how, how, how would they go about the testing and where they would have that testing perform. So um, what we've come up with is a list of guiding principles that these chemists could adhere to to figure out um, what, what, what the best route is to determine whether their chemical is um, hazardous. And 
the principles that we've developed um, go along the lines of first they need to determine um, whether their chemical is um, whether a chemical has a hazard and that has bringing up the hazard identification should be important in all phases of development and then um, what assays they should perform during their chemical development to determine whether that chemical is hazard and hazardous or not and we use those guiding principles to develop a protocol, a tier-based protocol, somewhat similar to Mark's that he just showed on um, organizing how they should have those tests done, where they should have those tests done, and what sort of te particular tests should, should be done. So the protocol that we came up with, and Adelina mentioned this yesterday, it's, it's not a regulatory protocol, but it's rather a guide that chemists could follow along their um, development of a specific chemical to give them confidence as they go through the phases of development whether the chemical is um, endo endocrine disrupting or not. So we focus on endocrine disruption, but our guiding principles and protocol could be um, developed to capture all forms of toxicity. So we are focusing on kind of the most difficult of the testing, but this could be branched to encompass other encompass other forms of toxicity. So what we came up with is a, a um, tiered system, somewhat similar to some of the tiered systems you've seen before, but what we propose to do is put the fastest, cheapest testing up front. Those are the computational modeling, followed by high throughput screening and the zebrafish models, uh, which you saw a bit of yesterday. And then follow that up with more specific testing as the chemical goes further and further along in development. So these specific testings are would be run if a uh, chemical was um, perhaps showed some positive or some it, it had some hits early in a high throughput screening assay, or there was some indication of where this um, chemical had had functional issues, you would run specific cell-based assays to capture, um, to, to follow that up. And then after those, following those spe um, specialized cell, cell assays, you would then go on to animal or rodent type testing. So again, this is organized in a, a tiered system from the fastest, cheapest test, um, followed by the more expensive type of testing that take a, a little bit longer. So um, the protocol that we develop and we're going to publish has criteria for, for how, what assays should be chosen, such as the reliability, re reproducibility, the use of standards, the dose ranges, um, the performance standards of these assays. It would tell, give chemists an idea of what type of assays they should be looking for. And then we would also, we're also um, giving chemists an idea of what labs should be running these assays. They shouldn't just go to a lab that who is trying to market a specific test, but rather a lab who has um, proven standards. They have um, a proper, uh, a good reputation. They're following certain procedures and they're using um, certain testing guidelines. Um, so. The, it's important, too, that, um, as you've seen the last few days, that the testing that's been talked about is constantly deve being developed. And our protocol aims to be a, a, a moving protocol, not one that's set in stone this year and is meant to be followed five years down the road, but rather a protocol that's continually under development. And one of this... Um, things that we're grappling a bit with is where we're going to house this and how we're going to make this information available to chemists, how they can, um, at a particular moment in time, go to this protocol and come up with the best t testing strategy. And also a lot of the chemicals that are being developed are either replacement chemicals or chemicals with known structures and, 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 and uh, that already have a, um, somewhat of a predictive pathway. So our protocol um, is 
set up in a, a, a way that a green chemist could go to a specific, specific tier in that protocol, begin testing at that specific phase, and then move on. And as they moved on through the schemes, they would grow, gain confidence that the, the chemical is safe and that it's not going to be a health issue. Um, so we realize that there's many holes in this protocol right now. There's, as you saw the last few days, there's a lot of good tests that are out there, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So we need to incorporate that into our testing. We need to figure out where those holes are and how they're going to be filled. And so um, an issue that we've been um, raising in our meetings is how those, how those holes will be filled, who's going to pay for that, um, how tests are going to be not necessarily validated but verified, and um, how this information is going to be ma made available to chemists. Because, again, chemists aren't toxic toxicologists. They're not educated toxicologists. They, they want to we, we need to make it easy for them to um, come and test a, a chemical to, to figure out whether it's hazardous. They shouldn't have to um, take m many courses in toxicology to have that done. Um, another thing that's been, that was brought up this morning is where all this information will be ma um, made available. So we've been discussing um, different data management systems or maybe a warehouse of, of where we could have experts and data that these chemists could go to to have advice in how to proceed with chemical testing. So um, where this information will be stored, how it will be managed, how it will be analyzed, and, and, uh, um, and the validation or verification process behind that data is also an important issue to um, remember. And, and also the, another very important factor is who is going to pay for all of this in the, in the end game. Right now there's um, agencies that are out there that are in charge of regulation. There's agencies that are in charge of test validation. But there's, there's no system set up to promote new um, testing strategies or to warehouse this data or to advise chemists on how to proceed with testing their chemicals. So that's something um, that we've been working on and um, we've been, um, we have about a 50-50 mix of green chemists and biologists and um, we've been taking both, uh, both sides of the issue and we hope to have this um, white paper published um, within a couple couple months here and um, from that white paper we plan to to proceed with a, a moving framework and guidelines that chemists can follow well that's pretty uh, wonderful so I'm wondering if anyone around the panel um, either that has just made comments or the speakers would like to comment on this uh, proposal that you're working up uh, Mark just a, just a quick point, Tom. I think you're absolutely right on target. You know, what is the vehicle for this information? How do you get this information to the people who need to, to learn from it? And, and, and you're right, the chemists aren't toxicologists. There are, they aren't biologists. But we've learned that not only are the chemists the audience, but also the program manager, the engineer, are, the rocket scientist in my case. Um, and so, and so those, those funding people also need to be the audience. And this information has to be complete. It's got to be a, a full, complete technical foundation of what you know from a tox environmental health standpoint, but also has to be in clear language with recommendations in the end too, so that, that they can understand it if, if, you know, if it's just the executive summary and the recommendations, but they also have this technical foundation they can hand off to other folks who can do the other documents they need to do. Maybe it's NEPA, maybe it's you know, programmatic environmental safety health evaluation in my case, or you know, other documents of that sort. Yeah, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, um, you know, during my presentation, I talked about uh, you know our interest in, in bringing kind of new data to the table in an exploratory fashion within this framework of a voluntary program to kind of just see what what it uh, you know how we might be able to use this and this is additional data that of course we'd be interested in in, in exploring. However, you know, I do want to emphasize that um, kind of the use of this in actual decision making, even in a voluntary. Pr uh, fl framework is predicated on a level of confidence in um, uh, in the testing framework um, that um, it, 
it's important uh, for us, since we work with stakeholders, so it's not only confidence to prove to us that it's useful and, and it's workable, but we have to be able to communicate with our stakeholders in industry, in the NGO community, consumers, et cetera, that the, the new alternative test methods are, um, are, are bringing added value um, uh, to the table. And so I just wanted to emphasize that the communication, it's not only science to, scientist to scientist, but it's going to be scientist to stakeholder, and, and that's just another challenge. Mm -hmm. Sharon or Helen, would you like to comment? Um, I think I'd really like to pick up this point on this data availability because mm -hmm. that, again, it, this public availability of data, and as David mentioned as well, is, is so crucial in the end. And in, in Europe, we're not really, you know, we, we the, um, the actual uh, producer generates the data. We're not in the business of actually generating the data ourselves. So it, it's, it's getting then a hold of that data, you know, um, to make that available so it, it, the community can use it and build on it. And I think that point is really, really important. Do you have plans underway for making more broadly available the industry submissions? Uh, for sure. I mean, that the. Could you the, say um, a little bit about that? Um, well, in relation to, to REACH, um, the data that has been submitted is being made available on the ECHO website. You can go there and you can get the non-confidential data. Including the raw data? The raw data behind it has not been submitted, so you would not get that raw data. Uh -huh. You have the what's called the robust study summaries, so you right. don't have that behind. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it, are there plans to try to move deeper into, closer to getting more of the raw data available from the REACH program? Um, I'm not aware of, of any at the moment, no. Okay. I think um, the issue of actually um, funding some generation of, of data itself is, is, is uh, mm -hmm. might, it, it, that possibly may change in the future. Okay. Have to see. Thanks. Helen, would you like to comment? on either some of this discussion that THAD has presented on the um, protocol that they're developing for uh, tiering and staging eval uh, evaluation of chemicals or any of the other things you've heard this morning. Actually, the, it is sort of related. There is a comment that, that came to me this morning that's related to this confidence issue and all the schemes that everybody's doing and all these you know, very convoluted and very complicated processes and tests. Um, I always make sure that my team understands that we will make mistakes. We will. And I make sure that our management understands that we will make mistakes and that what we need to do is make sure that we can recover from those mistakes quickly. So in the case of this rapid testing, we were talking last night about false positives and false negatives and how um, a false positive can really stain the record of a potentially good replacement. Uh, we want to make sure that we can correct, course correct, when something like that happens in a credible way and allow ourselves to have those mistakes because that really will advance the science. We don't want to have such a high confidence requirement that we never get anything useful out of it. So that was really my general comment about everything from the testing all the way to the um, protocol. So in thinking in terms of framework, my understanding is that from yet your talk yesterday is that HP pretty heavily uses the green screen. And yet we have lots of information that could potentially improve on that kind of screen. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how you might take further steps to evolve given this emerging uh, right. both conceptual frameworks as well as the newer data and um, this whole issue of mid-course correction? Well, we don't actually own the rights to, to it. Clean Production Action does. But um, as we've become heavier users, we've become more involved in giving feedback on how to evolve. And um, they work very closely with the DFE um, team as well. And so it will evolve over time. The scores are, that are generated are linked to the 
revision of the screen at that point in time. So you can have a 1.0 score, a 1.2 score now that's been released in September. Um, 2.0 will come into line alignment with the alternatives assessment program and will also um, uh, improve where there's a significant gap on inorganics. That will be, um, I believe, fixed in 2.0. And we want it to be a living system because we want to be able to include new science as it comes in. There's some placeholders in there now for certain things, but we completely know that this is, we don't want to lock something down. And that's one of the reasons we don't want it to necessarily be go, become part of regulation because that freezes it in time, whereas right now we can use it um, to make decisions mm -hmm. um, and it's flexible and it'll evolve. Okay, um, Tom Osmuth, would you like to comment? Yeah, I'm kind of sitting here internally conflicted. Um, and the, the conflict arises from complete frustration with a regulatory system that takes you know, 15 years to get guidelines, five years to get standard evaluation procedures, um, extremely slow, extremely fraught with the Administrative Procedures Act issues. And yeah, this is the first I've heard of the, the framework. I'm anxious to see it. You know, it's interesting. I think the, the frustration with the regulatory apparatus, which moves very slow when it comes to guidelines and frameworks and evaluations, <clears throat> what that's leading to is CPA. It's leading to a lot of other types of unofficial protocols that will become the de facto protocol. And I think the one thing that concerns me is probably the lack of not peer review, but maybe stakeholder involvement like you'd have, let's say, with EdStack or you'd have with... Uh, Anything that EPA you know does, where you actually have stakeholder input, California is doing the same kind of thing. Um, so I think it's a good thing, and I think it, it advances the field. I just get a little bit nervous about a relatively small group of people putting that together and handing it off to to chemists, um, realizing that every every complex chemical decision I've been involved in is really complex. There's lots of difficulties understanding the relationship of a, of a certain result to, from humans and animals. It just seems to me like a good concept. It'd be interesting to see what it looks like. I'm glad you're doing it. And then that's coming out of my probably frustration with the, the official way that protocols and that get done, which is glacially slow. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that one, so there is a stakeholder process. Um, one of the things that um, does come up that is a difference, and you can either like the difference or not like the difference, is that um, when there's a public stakeholder <clears throat> process with um, a government agency, you can be drowned out by certain voices that can be really, really loud. A minority can take over, and not necessarily pushing it in a good scientific direction or good for public health. And it's sort of similar to cradle to cradle where they've, they want to maintain control over, over it um, to have aspirational targets um, and so that it's not like a formal standards process. And, and I understand where, why they want to do that. Having done many, many standards, <laughs> standard setting is the worst part of my job. <laughs> And the irony is I have to fight to be able to do it, which is so wrong in many ways. But um, it is really painful when you've got a group with this one-issue group that comes in. Sadly to say, often it's an industry group, and they will dominate that discussion. And so there has to be, in some ways, a sort of a safe harbor where there's a stakeholder process, a public process, but you've got an arbiter who does not absolutely have to have the 80% consensus. Because that, that's the death of good standards, is that 80% consensus vote requirement for a lot of standards like IEEE and so on. Any other comments? Um, Kate. No, Helen, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, and whether you think, I mean, obviously we, we deal with stakeholders as well, and I think you can have a very polarized discussion that can be dominated by by uh, one or a few interested parties on issues that I think affect many, many people in many communities and many stakeholders, some of whom are not at the table. Um, but do you, would you endorse a kind of a listening to that and then retreating to a smaller group? Or how do you see, do you have some suggestions of, of, of effectively engagement, of effective engagement I, that, I think the listening different. is really important. I mean, that you, that's absolutely critical. Um, and yet, um, sometimes they are wrong. 
okay? And sometimes there's just an, an opinion thing, but sometimes there are factual, you know, whatever. It's like <clears throat> there are facts involved. And there's got to be an arbiter. Um, I, I do music. I actually conduct. And um, in, in our group, it's a very small group, and each of them are they're professional musicians, and they're very good at what they do. And they have an opinion on, on how that music should be done. And we are, it's a very egalitarian system. But when there is a dispute, I decide. And it's really important to have someone in that role because it can break down into just pandemonium if you don't have some final arbiter that, that makes the final call. Mark or Jen, would you like to make any further comments? No, those are good comments. I agree. Okay. I'll just make a quick comment. Um, the kind of work that we do, we are not the decision authority. It may be a little bit different than other folks here. Um, we just provide the information. The ultimate decision authority really is the program manager who's developing this system. He's, he's the one who's in charge of full life cycle assessment. It's our job to provide him with all the information he needs to make those decisions. So uh, it, it's a slightly different nuanced procedure. And the, the other issue I'd just briefly bring up is, you know, based on your question here, how do you get chemists and toxicologists together? By the funding to it. I mean, it, it sounds simple, but that's, that's the bottom line. Um, right our, our program, they have to. They have to consult with us. And if they don't, and they don't have an answer, is this greener or not, then they don't get funded. Okay. Good. I'd like to open now up to the audience if they'd like to comment on anything they've heard so far, and then <laughs> we, we are going to have, um, which we will take in order. <laughs> so if you could please introduce yourself and your affiliation. I'm Bruce Blumberg from UC Irvine, and I'd like to follow up on what that introduced because I'm part of that group. And this, this idea arose from a great sense of frustration of those of us in the endocrine disruptor community with hearing things like, well, you can't test for endocrine disruptors, which the American Chemistry Council says. And in Helen's talk yesterday, there was a blank where endocrine disruptors were. And we know very well how to test for endocrine disruptors, how to test for endocrine disruptor activities from in vitro all the way to animal studies. So we said, this is a gap that has to be filled, and we got together to fill that gap. Hmm. This is going to be something that's voluntary. We suggest this. If you want to screen for endocrine disruptor activity in your chemicals and, and make them more green, this is the way we think you should do it. And if the stakeholders disagree with that, they're welcome to continue to lobby EPA as they do to have the kinds of tests out that um, came out of EdStuck. Those are available. So we're providing an alternative approach that interested parties can use to try and make the best chemicals they can. So one part of it is testing for endocrine disruptors. The other part is interpreting the data that comes out of those tests. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't clear to me whether or not that is also part of your framework that you've developed. Of course. Okay. That, that will come. Great. Thank you. Ruben Abagian, uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, I'd like to comment about two uh, things. One is data sharing, and, and there were several excellent points uh, talking about the necessity of that. So I, what I want to uh, um, uh, point out at is, is that um, when we talk about data, uh, usually we think uh, of that as a basically essentially a dump of data with usually no feedback. And what happens is that there are two sides of that, uh, of that situation. There are chemicals, and the chemicals, uh, uh, um, and that's why there is this process which uh, Alex and Adelina referred to, which is that you have a initial data, and then you, you have the data set, which takes a year to produce. Um, and then there are two sides of that. One is that the chemicals of complex entities, they have different protonation states. There are alternative uh, uh, ways to draw the same chemical. There are also lots of errors. Uh, there are tautomers. Um, and also there are uh, uh, transformations. So you start from one chemical and then it goes into another stereoisomer, another tautomer. Uh, and sometimes we know which one is uh, hazardous, sometimes we don't. Uh, but um, my point is that when we think about data sharing, here is my data, there is no feedback, I think that's wrong. What, what needs to be done 
is what, for example, Wikipedia does for every entry. It should actually be, be invited to mature and uh, receive feedback, uh, which can be negative, positive, and sometimes there are disputes, so that we, we, at the end, we have mature data sets, which then can be used for training. And that's what we completely lack in that. There is, uh, when uh, computational people produce their data sets, they keep it to themselves, usually they are not shared, even though the initial data, which are virtually unusable, uh, they're there. I mean, uh, and uh, another point is that there, there is no single person who can do that because there is chemistry, and even the chemists, uh, it, it's very complex, all these transformations, and there's also essays. On the essay side, it's equally difficult uh, because, um, uh, you know, there are uh, all these details about, you know, if, if in 1536 format, the wells are too small. Mm -hmm. um, that's one side, so data should be allowed to mature, and the, the finally clean data uh, at the end is our goal. The second point is on uh, evaluation of essay. Every essay needs to be uh, properly evaluated and uh, in terms of false positives, false negatives, and ex expectations. And that, um, uh, number one, again, uh, people should be allowed to comment about that and say, well, I tried that and didn't work for me. That's a bad uh, uh, um, uh, test. Now we have PubChem with thousands of tests. And turns out that most of them are, for different reasons, unusable. But you know, you can't, you, you don't know that. Sometimes, uh, you know, Steve Bryan can tell you that if you only look for this kind, then they're more reliable, or something like that. But again, we should be allowed to comment about that. Now, uh, um, uh, in in that in the computational side of those tests, I think what's important to recognize that uh, how do we uh, assign numbers in terms of false positives, false negatives? So what needs to be done there is um, uh, people do this five-fold cross-validation, but five-fold cross-validation um, uh, will not give you an idea what happens when the new chemistry is presented to that test, right? So there, there are ways around that. Um, and there is another problem which is called the um, activity cliff, which is basically twin chemicals, very similar chemicals, uh, will have different activity. So the, um, uh, the, the test should be designed in such a way so that they give you an idea uh, uh, in terms of what happens when the new chemical from a new family, new chemotype, is uh, uh, presented to that test. And secondly, uh, what happens with these twin pairs of chemicals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of challenges for data sharing, data normalization, data cleanliness um, that potentially would be worth taking up in, different, in a different forum in more detail. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Hi, Richard Dennison, EDF. Um, I have a comment related to Thad's um, description of the protocol that's merging. It's great, <clears throat> great to see that uh, being developed, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the details. Um, one of the things that, if I understand it right, I, I wanted to flag, which I think is very intriguing and useful, is that it really flips the concept of tiered testing around where usually tiered testing only advances things to the next level where a flag is raised in the earlier level. And that puts a huge question mark around the extent to which false negatives are being missed, if you will. In this case, as I understand it, you're increasing confidence in a finding that you may not see at an early stage in other words, you're, you're, you're advancing things that don't raise red flags to the next level, thereby increasing the confidence that you didn't miss something. And um, I think that's a very intriguing approach, and it, it really takes away some of the concerns that I think a lot of us have with the way tiered approaches are often uh, often um, laid out. And uh, do I have that right? And yeah. if so, uh, so, can you so the idea is as if you were to hit a positive early on, if the chemist was to hit a positive early on, he'd either go back to the drawing board or if that positive was in a specific area, he would follow that up with a more of a um, comprehensive assay. Say it was in a high-throughput screening and it lit up the um, estrogen receptor section, he would follow that up with um, e-screens or, or something to that effect. So a hit anywhere along the tiered system means to pull back, to reanalyze, or just to throw the chemical out. And the idea is to put that, the most fast and cheapest um, tests early on so that the chemist can 
weed out those problem chemicals early in development and it's not a costly procedure and that, that's going to encourage them to adopt a um, guideline similar to that. Lynn Katz, Cherry, Great Lakes Screen Chemistry Network. And I want to say that I'm, I'm very appreciative to have been able to come to this workshop because I generally work on the sort of opposite end of the spectrum. I see that there is a spectrum, that we're all pretty much doing a lot of the same work, but from a macro perspective, which is often what I do, to what I consider a micro perspective here. And it's given me a lot of insight into that aspect. But I do want to raise some, I, I want to respond to some of the questions that you put up there, actually. And I want to start by saying that I think in the future we really have to discipline ourselves to say greener chemicals and material design. Because I think we have to recognize that there, A, is no single definition of green. And even if there were, we're not there yet. And we don't even know how to determine that. We can get closer, but we, I think we'd be hard put to come up with any chemical and say this is a green chemical. And along those lines then, when you talk about a green criterion and you talk about looking at that in capital G green and capital C chemistry, which I distinguish from small green chemistry because the capital ones are very specific, a very specific thing. Um, inherent in that is the concept of continuous improvement. And so when you're talking about a criterion, and somebody just mentioned that they didn't want to see um, standards, I think it was Helen, because that, you, then you write things in stone in some ways, or legislation. And green chemistry is inherently dynamic. It's always going to be changing. So if you do want to develop a metric or criteria, you have the challenges to develop them in a way that can accommodate the constantly changing knowledge that is um, emerging from the kinds of work that everybody here is doing. Yeah, Otherwise, I think those are points very well taken. And we have heard quite a bit over the past two days about it's just too early to fix anything in stone that we really need the flexibility to move things along in a positive direction. But there, are, at this point, there are no absolutes. Right, and there, therefore that, you know, you have to think about how, how are you going to answer or are those even the right questions to be asking right now? Yes. And um, that brings me to my, um, and the other question is, that some of the questions you're asking also um, ha are answered by other groups that are represented here. And so how do, you, when, how do you know what the chemicals are that you should be putting yes. through these assays? Um, industry may have one answer to that. Toxicologists and chemists may have another answer. Mm -hmm. Public health people may have another answer. And so I think there has to be more dialogue between all of those groups yes. to figure out what's going to, you know, how to, to approach that. Yeah. And Thank I you. Thank you. For I have those one, more, oh, okay. Okay. one more. Okay. One more. One more quick point because okay, sorry. we we have a line of speakers sure, in sorry. ten minutes. The other to thing go. is that somebody said um, we talked about decision making, and I just want to end by saying that um, as I just asked, are we asking the right questions? And some, particularly in response to DFE for whom I have an enormous amount of um, respect. But when we do these alternatives assessment and we look at phthalates, for example, do we really want to come up with a safe phthalate that then leaves PVC still around and people can say, oh, we have safer PVC? I think that those, we have to really question the paths that we are setting ourselves on because we could end up in that situation. and. We won't have been asking the right questions, so we will have ending up in the place that we started to go, as Einstein said. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think that that's the first time it, Paul Anastas, used, in, in some of his talks, have brought up this issue of completely different product design. And we haven't really, we've been speaking in terms of substitutes rather than conceiving of 
new types of products to serve the same function. So very point well taken. And Bostrom University of Washington and committee member. I want to thank the panelists and speakers for excellent presentations and discussions today as well as yesterday. I've really enjoyed it even though this is completely outside of my field. Um, I had three uh, points I wanted to make. The first is on the issue of engagement and consensus. There is a tendency among federal agencies in particular to uh, want to look for consensus, but there's a lot of research suggesting that majority rule um, decision processes may be more effective in coming up with better decisions than consensus processes. So that's a broader issue. This is probably not the right, right forum for that. The other two points have to do with um, something that's come up repeatedly, which is the usefulness of decision making um, for uh, the usefulness of information for decision making. And Helen brought up a uh, decision parsimony that was discussed again today. Um, and there are numerous ways of achieving parsimony, but in this kind of a context where you have computational toxicological information and other giant databases and really complex system pictures, parsimony is very hard to achieve and requires a lot of, uh, of decisions. We don't have a whole lot of research looking at which ways of best achieving parsimony communicate most effectively. So I want to call for more empirical research on how best to achieve parsimony and decision making around these issues. The second has to do with visual representation of information. There is some research on how people interpret visual, visual representations such as pie charts and graphs and that kinds of things, but not a whole lot. There's actually a new paper out in science today on visualization of uncertainty and calling for more empirical research on that. So I'd also like to suggest that when we go through uh, these kinds of funding and resource development uh, processes in the agencies and elsewhere, there be some consideration to funding social science on how people interpret these kinds of representations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. <coughs> Helmut Zarbel, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. So I had a question uh, for Tad or, or comment, uh, a combination thereof. So uh, having to do with the, um, the tiered system that, that you're proposing, so that the central to that is a curated database, right, uh, which is, is central. So those of us who were part of the original Toxicogenomics Consortium will remember the SEBS database, which had a lot of promise um, but never materialized to, to any great extent. So I was wondering to what extent are you utilizing that infrastructure and, and, and um, you know, the uh, lessons learned from that as you put together these new databases? Oh. We've talked more about a database of information about testing protocols rather than the data itself. Um, so we were through around, uh, have been throwing the idea of putting up a, a place maybe at a university or a, a private foundation or, or, or whatever of setting up a system where chemists could go to get an idea of what tests are available, the, the validity of those tests, um, to give them information on each phase of development of their chemical. Um, we haven't got into discussing where the actual data from these tests should be warehoused. Um, maybe a good place for that would be NTP. They, they do have subs and they have um, developed a, a system beyond that, but um, that's one of the, the, the points that I brought up is there's not a system right now to warehouse all of that data nor to make sense of that data. So I think that's something that we need to invest some thinking about and probably some resources in is where we can house that data, who can make sense of that data, and what data that goes in there is valid or not. That's a good point. Lou Gross, uh, National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis at the University of Tennessee, and I'm the Board on Life Sciences liaison to this committee. I have three points uh, in which I'm trying to make connections to other fields that, uh, that may relate to this. The first one is issues of uncertainty associated with testing, associated with all the components of that tiered response that, that Tad talked about, and that there, there are approaches in what's called adaptive management about how to make decisions under uncertainty, and there may be benefits to thinking about how that might apply to some of these issues. Um, the second point is on data management and warehousing and that uh, it is often not just the data that you want but the methods and mechanisms by which you produce those data. So in computer science jargon, that is the workflow and the National Science Foundation has supported a variety of cyber infrastructure pro uh, projects that have attempted to combine workflow and data 
and it might be useful in thinking about how you would warehouse this with thinking about building on that kind of infrastructure that's already been built. And uh, the third thing is on uh, sort of combining the qualitative and quantitative methods, the sort of red stoplight thing, uh, Mark, and actually several of you have shown, uh, and how to do that effectively. Uh, in, in some sense, this is a relative assessment protocol, and there are a variety of statistical methods that may be used to combine qualitative and quantitative assessments. And if you're interested in that, I'd be very interested in having a request for us to do something on that at, the, uh, at NIMBUS at the National Institute for Mathematical and Bio Biological Synthesis, and we can support at least uh, a workshop on that. Thank you. Wonderful so, invitation. So real quickly on that, um, we are interested in that, and one of the things that we've been um, wrestling about in our protocol is how, when, when you get a hit on a chemical that it is it does come up as a positive test in, in one of those phases, what you do with it, whether you give it a color, whether you give it a number, or whether you just throw it out. So um, right now we're wrestling with what we should do with that and how we should make those decisions, so that is a good point. Great. Marty Stevens, <coughs> Humane Society of the United States. <coughs> um, there seems to be a, a, a con clear consensus that we need to move forward with the kinds of approaches that have been talked about for the, for the past day and a half. And that brings up the issue of incentives, particularly for industry in moving forward. And a number of speakers have touched on this, starting with Paul Anastas. And Cal mentioned some this morning as well. I'm, I'm just wondering if, if one of the incentives for industry to, to do this kind of work at the front end of product design is that they uh, would would uh, get a sort of a, a waiver of some of the downstream animal testing and other kinds of testing that would otherwise have been done, given the testing at the front end. And of course, I'm interested in, in reducing animal use in general, so that's the context of my question. So um, we're short on time. I'm wondering if anyone wants to make a very quick response or we'll take it as a comment of something to explore. Okay. I can quickly comment on that. Um, one thing that we've discussed in our protocol is giving a, a level of confidence within those tiers as you proceed down and, and giving that chemical kind of, a, you know, as it goes down to the fifth tier or fourth tier, the gold standard or a silver standard. But again, you get into the area between regulatory testing and and non-regulatory testing, and that gets to, to be problematic. But we're, our, we're setting up our system to, to go above and beyond what the regulators do so that by the time someone has advanced their chemical through all four or five tiers, that they have a very high level of confidence that they do have a green chemical or a chemical that's going to be safe, and that it's the right thing to do. Mark, Just real quickly, quick. I think at a minimum what it helps us to do all these new methods that we're coming up with is help us to really focus our in vivo work. So we're looking at the targets mm -hmm. and we're looking more closely at the targets to try to get at that mechanism when we do those, when we do use animals. Thank you. George. George Daston, Procter & Gamble. First of all, I want to thank everybody for, um, you know, it's really gratifying to see this many smart people thinking about um, this really complicated but important problem. Um, I wanted to particularly address some of the questions that we're not going to get to in the, the panel discussion about, you know, should should we be combining tox principles with other with with other considerations? And my my contention is, how can we not? Um, <laughs> and just you know, just some some food for thought. I mean, you know, certainly um, you know we have to uh, have. Um, safe chemicals and safe products as a, a minimum level of entry into the marketplace. I, I, I don't think that there can be any argument about that. Um, but uh, as we start to think about substitutions or new product designs, I think it's really important to um, have all of the considerations that, that, that go into whether that's a good idea or not on the table along with the toxicology. I mean, a trivial example um, is that if we substitute something that's five times less potent 
um, but takes ten times as much to do the job, um, you know, have we have we have we you know made an improvement? The answer is is no. And we've talked about that a little bit in terms of including exposure information, but I think it's more than that. And you know, as we as we move forward in terms of um, you know products that are going to require. Uh, less energy to transport and therefore have to be compacted to um, a, a, f a much more concentrated form. I mean, those are issues where we really have to weigh um, those kinds of uh, safety considerations with, in this case, the, the transport of energy use. Or if we're going to design entirely new products, um, I don't think it's sufficient for us to um, simply say no because something inches up on um, one vector of our tox criteria um, but is, is, I think, objectively still safe by the criteria that we use, um, but could make huge differences in terms of, um, you know, some sort of societal need, energy usage, carbon footprint. I don't know. So, so you know, even though I think we needed to limit ourselves to talks in order to you know have a, a fruitful day and a half workshop, I don't want us to forget that point that mm -hmm. this it has to be integral with all of the other considerations of green product design. Right. Where do you draw your boundary for problem definition? Yes, is really critical. Thank you for that, George. I'm Linda Wannenberg from NASA. I'm also liaison to this effort. And following George is always hard. <laughs> but the one thing I guess I would simply like to say is that we now see that we are leaning out with a whole bunch of uncertainty, a whole bunch of questions, new definitions, and the like. And we can spend a great deal of time about the definitions. But we really, the question is, the federal family is very interested in working on this issue with industry and collaborating with others. This could be a very collaborative effort. Uh, this could be something where we could really find things that are very much integrative and get us answers that we need to use resources properly. So I just say this as the opening salvo to folks saying that the federal agencies are interested in this issue and would very much like to work with everyone in this room. Thank you. And Adelina, you have the last word. I, I just have a, a quick resource to share with you, actually. Uh, we heard echoed in this room several times the need for a, a repository where we can easily access uh, some toxicology data. And uh, it occurred to me that this is something that we're actually developing that's going to be online the next couple of months at the Center for Green Chemistry, which is a resource uh, that allows you to look up numerical toxicity data, um, gives you some idea for mechanism of action where it's known, and we're currently putting that data in and also some of the properties that um, have been predicted for these chemicals. And hopefully that will facilitate molecular design. And, and we're also going to have a link where toxicologists can hopefully give us feedback and input into um, the mechanisms of action. So that's going to be online in a couple of months. Hopefully it will be a useful resource. Great. Thank you very much. Well, now I'd like to close the session and thank all the commenters, the speakers, and the panelists. Thank you so much. And Turn it over to Bill Farlin for to wrap this all up in a pretty present for us. Okay. <laughs> Are we Well, this is always the, uh, the hard part of uh, trying to capture a day and a half of, of very good, very fruitful discussions and, and commentary in a few minutes. But um, I'll give it a try and, and uh, hit some of the high points. Um, first of all, I just want to follow up on uh, Linda Winterberg's uh, comment and uh, remind us that uh, this particular workshop, uh, while it is part of our series on emerging issues in environmental health decision making, was uh, stimulated because of our federal liaison group and uh, the uh, uh, NSTC and Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, Toxics and Risk Subcommittee, and the fact that this is a, an issue that is uh, front of mind for a number of the federal agencies. And so uh, we were very pleased to have them as a partner for uh, this particular workshop, and uh, I think it's, uh, it illustrates the fact that uh, we all need to be working together on this, uh, this particular issue. Um, starting off the, uh, the discussion, uh, we recognized that uh, this was really an opportunity. It was an opportunity for us to 
anticipate some problems and look for some solutions and, and uh, that it was going to take multi multidisciplinary approaches for testing and assessment and uh, we could bring in new technologies and these are all the things that we've been um, uh, thinking about and, and working uh, together on as we begin to think about how we can uh, introduce new tools and balance screen design and, and efficacy. Um, Paul started off this discussion by, uh, by suggesting that this is where problems meet solutions and I thought that was uh, a quite a good statement of uh, the way that uh, we are, are approaching this and that um, uh, the real challenge is to bring these kinds of issues to scale quickly enough so that they can make a difference for us. We'll talk a little bit more about that issue as we go. Um, in fact, he said that uh, you know green chemistry is in place, and we heard some very good examples of how that is beginning to uh, uh, to come into uh, its own. Um, aside from the fact that we have looked at bio-based materials and aqueous solvents and and synthetic methods, uh, uh, all of these areas are leading us into a uh, more a focused approach to try to deal with these issues of designing hazard out of some of the um, the products that we're producing and and looking at alternatives that might uh, be more helpful for us. Um, he remind us and reminded us though, uh, and this issue came up in uh, George's comment just a few minutes ago, that we really need to focus uh, not only on the toxicology but on the uh, physical issues and the global issues that are associated with chemi uh, chemicals and chemistry that, uh, that uh, we happen to be using uh, and that uh, this uh, does constitute, as Lauren said, the, the bounds around the kind of assessments that we have to do. So while we focused on toxicology here, I think it's important for us to recognize that those bounds can be broader. Uh, we had a couple of examples. I think uh, Mark Thompson's uh, New products are and d example and, and Helen Holder's uh, material selection examples were, were very good case studies for us of uh, how the, the industry is moving forward. And um, there were some, uh, I thought, uh, particularly uh, pertinent comments that were made there. Uh, green chemistry is knowledge intensive. This is going to be something that uh, we're going to struggle with for a while, and I think this is uh, important for us. And that these feedback loops that we have as we begin to work through the, the process of, um, of decision making is, uh, is a theme that uh, permeated the discussion. Uh, ultimately, we, uh, we're taking an approach where we're going to identify some, some knockouts, we're going to look for opportunities uh, to, uh, to solve issues, and then we're going to have to make some selections. And uh, this is going on now, and it's something that uh, I think is a um, uh, a testament to our ability to bring some of these uh, activities uh, to the fore and, and start using some of the tools that uh, are available to us. Uh, Helen reminded us that uh, in some cases laws have stimulated this. Uh, in fact, the international uh, uh, community is probably a little bit ahead on this in terms of some regulatory decision making that is leading to some of these kinds of uh, decisions and uh, uh, we heard a little bit about the context uh, this morning in terms of some of our domestic activities that are are leading to um, to these kinds of approaches. Um, Helen also reminded us that uh, making good choices at the start of some of these things is particularly important, uh, not only because we're we're uh, keeping uh, hazardous chemicals out of the environment, but because the cost of replacements or the time and energy to remove them at a later point is a difficult issue. And so the, the benefits of thinking this through uh, early and looking at this is important to us. Uh, so again, shifting to this idea of hazard uh, reduction is important to us and that we need new and better materials, uh, fast predictive screens and assessments, and um, uh, green chemistry at or prior to formulas, formulation really is the mantra of the discussion that we have, uh, have heard throughout the couple of days. Um, Lauren actually started this morning by talking about some of the highlights of the, the testing activities that had uh, been described. Uh, I'll hit just a few of those, uh, those comments. Uh, Robert Tangway uh, 
sort of uh, challenged us a little bit by talking about the use of uh, in vivo models early and how that may be particularly important for us as um, uh, toxicologists and, and chemists, uh, particularly because of these in vivo systems as the integrator. And this integration is important as we begin to look at how we're going to bring um, new approaches, uh, high throughput, high content type of approaches into the, the mix. Um, what he did suggest, though, was that we are still faced with this dilemma of, uh, of data tools that actually allow us to take the kind of information, including uh, the behavioral observations that he talked about, and factor that in with other kinds of observations that uh, we have from both in vivo and in vitro and in silico types of models. Um, David Dix, uh, as usual, gave a, uh, an excellent presentation on uh, uh, how we can use high throughput screening and, and uh, develop a uh, uh, perspective around a, a chemical. Um, I think the, uh, the issues that, um, uh, that come up with regard to a bioactivity signature uh, workflow and, and how this will allow us to eventually get to the, the use of uh, synthetic tissues was a uh, highlight of, uh, of one of uh, uh, one of the things that he was talking about, and it led us into the discussion that came up several times during the, the day and a half about uh, doing complementary exposure work uh, so that we would have estimates of uh, human exposure that could be factored into our decision making, and, and that was certainly one of the, um, the highlights. Uh, Russ Nevins uh, talked about the uh, CSE system that Pfizer is using, and uh, I think one of the take-homes there was really about the importance of annotation of the data that we get and, and the ability to really uh, factor in that kind of a perspective around the data as we uh, uh, not only evaluate it, but as we archive it so that that's available to, uh, to others. Adelina talked about uh, uh, this really being a nascent field and uh, evolving relatively quickly. Uh, her discussion around some of the strategies to inhibit uh, interaction with biological systems is uh, interesting and, and uh, is one, uh, one approach to this, I think, that uh, uh, has gotten some traction. And uh, I think that as uh, we develop more design characteristics and get measured data around this idea of um, uh, inhibiting interactions, uh, uh, we may see some uh, some very interesting molecules emerge. Uh, Alex talked about uh, hybrid models and uh, really QSAR plus uh, the idea that we can uh, we can do better than we have been doing with QSAR in the past. And uh, uh, by looking carefully at our uh, our model data sets and new information and using an iterative process, uh, we can um, really put chemical and biological data together in a better way than we have done previously. Um, Ed Carney, I think, um, uh, Ed, I'd say you gave us some uh, healthy skepticism to uh, designing out hazard, and I think that was an important part of this, uh, this discussion. Uh, his NIDICAP uh, example really talked about the fact that uh, we are going to miss some things, and, and this came up as a theme, uh, that uh, there are certain types of, of toxicities that will not be apparent with some of our screening types of activities. and so. Having a platform approach is going to be important for us for the general areas of toxicology, but there are going to be some things that we will miss, and we heard that again uh, this morning. Um, I think um, uh, certainly what uh, he suggested was that we ought to uh, look at some endpoints with lower complexity that one might allow us to get some early wins in terms of some of these design activities and, and perhaps using a stepwise approach to to build confidence. The discussion session yesterday was, uh, I thought, uh, started off very nicely with the nanomaterials uh, discussion that Jim Hutchison and Robert Tangway uh, uh, tag teamed on. Uh, we got into a lot of uh, issues around whether or not uh, these are the right assays, uh, issues around false positives and false negatives, and our level of tolerance for those kinds of things. Uh, that's going to be an important area for this, uh, this issue. Communication came up at that point uh, with regard to, to how we are able to uh, develop confidence not only among the practitioners but among uh, decision makers and the public uh, who are going to be uh, uh, 
um, sort of the receptors for, for these kinds of activities and uh, that uh, this communication theme extended into our discussion again earlier uh, uh, this morning or, or uh, in our discussion this morning. Uh, we heard about phenotypic anchoring, uh, the, the issues around data and model iteration, uh, dose and acceptability, uh, efficient progress through coordination, uh, the importance of education. Uh, and I think this came up uh, actually as a, a, uh, an issue of discussion at the table at dinner last night, and I heard some of it again this morning. Um, you know, how do we make sure that students who are now in the pipeline are going to be cognizant of these kinds of issues and uh, hopefully will be uh, our, our next generation of practitioners uh, that can uh, advance this particular field? Um, and how do we educate chemists about toxicology and, to and toxicologists about chemistry so that we can uh, continue to advance uh, today? Um, Marty reminded us that we need to keep our eye on the target here, and in this case, uh, although we have not neglected the issue of ecological impacts, we really are focused on uh, impacts on human populations and environmental health decision making with this particular group. And so uh, uh, we heard some more today about the ability to uh, verify models and really focus on the idea of uh, refining the kind of testing that we're doing with that human target in mind. Um, the, the uh, two talks that uh, we had this morning uh, by um, Cal Bayer Anderson and, and Sharon Munn, I think, gave us a, uh, a sense of, of both national and international programs uh, that are uh, focused on um, both voluntary and, uh, to some degree, um, in the EU, um, uh, regulation-based um, uh, needs for uh, green chemistry approaches. Um, I think that um, the, the DFE program is a, uh, a hallmark for the kind of activity that we would like to see moving forward, and I think there's a, uh, a real interest um, in that program in seeing some of the advances in the field being incorporated into the kind of decision making that, uh, that Cal was talking about. She sort of left us with the, uh, the idea that the, um, the next generation of hazard evaluation is really a work in progress, that uh, we're really looking at chemical prioritization for testing human equivalent doses associated with pathway perturbations that allow us to be able to uh, do pathway-based uh, potency comparisons for relative rankings that are based primarily on functions of chemicals, and that that, uh, that will really take us in a good direction. Uh, Sharon gave us a, uh, an opportunity to, uh, uh, again, think about the um, evolution to green, uh, green design rather than uh, dealing with some of these issues uh, after the fact. Um, she was very focused on uh, hypothesis-driven mode, uh, mode of action approaches, and again, that's, uh, that I think is heartening in terms of the approaches that we have uh, taken in the past. and. Um, uh, are very consistent with some of the things that Tom Osmitz uh, mentioned in his discussions about uh, uh, perhaps putting a, a little bit more uh, practical and immediate approaches in place and some rigor that's needed in order to make some of these kinds of decisions. Um, we heard uh, from a number of, uh, of the presenters the importance of a harmonized uh, platform for data exchange, as, uh, as Sharon called it and um, basically uh, looking for ways that we can make this bridge between classical toxicology and the new uh, types of uh, testing that we're looking at. Um, again, I think it's uh, important for us to, uh, uh, to deal with some of the issues that uh, we heard uh, coming up that, uh, uh, that lead to this discussion that Tom um, uh, posed, which is uh, how do we go from data to information to knowledge to understanding to wisdom. And, and I think that's, a, uh, that's something that we might keep in front of our, our minds as we think about this particular topic and um, uh, recognize the fact that we have these educational and cultural challenges that are going to come along with trying to educate not only the, the fields that we deal with routinely, but decision makers and the public. 
Um, the discussion session that we just wrapped up with, I think, uh, um, sort of came around again on a number of the issues that I just described and, and really uh, uh, gave us a chance to, uh, to think about some of the issues around uh, public availability of data, open source approaches, the concept of, of iteration and mature data sets and eventually getting to clean data sets that are, are going to be most important for us as we move forward. Um, all about communication and, and how we can uh, do a better job of working with practitioners and, and with uh, decision makers in the public. And um, um, a little sobering thought, but I think an important one uh, that, that Helen raised, which was that mistakes will be made, but that it uh, really is something that um, uh, we have to, to think about carefully and we can't be in the state of paralysis by analysis that uh, has very often characterized the way we have looked at some of these things in the past. And so uh, this really is an opportunity for us to bring, uh, I think, what, um, what we have heard as uh, greener chemicals into, uh, uh, into commerce and continuously um, improve upon those with alternatives um, analysis as we move forward. So again, I want to thank everybody for the kind of uh, uh, thoughtful comments that were made in the formal presentations and in the uh, question and answer period. Uh, thank our, our federal colleagues for uh, raising this as an important issue and uh, for all of you to uh, think about how you can spread the word uh, on some of the things that have come out of this particular conference and, and perhaps stimulate additional thinking. Thanks very much.